All right. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of the Creditor Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Palmieri, and with me today is Nick Wynn. Nick founded a tech company called Tasty Labs, which was later acquired by Walmart. He is the former vice president of Firefox product and is currently a fact checker on vietfactcheck.org. Nick, thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Thanks, Chase. Yeah, so you have a, a lot of experience that we're going to want to dive into today. Um, but the way that I first came across your work was through this blog piece that you wrote, where you talked about a context graph um, and, and how it relates to web browsers and how web browsers could be improved upon. So can, yep. you, can you give us a taste of what your dream was for that type of product or integration with the browser? Yeah, so uh, I, I think it's what's really interesting about technology, particularly people who are, you know, who grew up and were adults from like the 90s to today, uh, is how much change we've seen and how we can really subdivide like the evolution of the consumer internet into these different eras, right? And so, you know, I'm 44 years old. I graduated from high school in 1994. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I was one of maybe five people that had an email address, uh, on the, you know, that you could actually send to with an you know, at symbol and a lot changed in the next five years, right? And so uh, some particle physicists in England created a, a platform called the web that was basically this idea that you could create documents and link to each other and, every, and, and it was really exciting because, you know, there was sort of this wild west in the 90s where people would create web pages and there wasn't really a good way to navigate or browse them. So you had Yahoo, you had, you know, uh, Alta Vista, you had Lycos, you had eventually Google, uh, but there was a very interesting time where people really worked together to build their Babylon 5 web rings or whatever. And so, um, you know, I saw that. And then in the 2000s, you know, you started to see these like sort of, we went from picking up Laura LeMay's HTML book and everyone was learning HTML in the late 90s to, you know, these platforms like Blogger where people, where it was much more turnkey, Blogger, WordPress, or uh, GeoCities, where you could create your own web page with just a few clicks. And so there was this kind of self-publishing boom in the 2000s. But then at the same time, I think what happened was um, that the internet became much more uh, monetized in terms of like the, the actual paths through, through which you traverse the web uh, was very monetized. So you went from, you know, chasepalmary.com like you, you know, would link to your buddies' web pages, and they would link to you, and then to the point where, like, hey, I don't want to lose that traffic. I want to link to people that are that you know have some affiliation with me, so that I can amplify, and you know, and where I don't lose all this money because I get money off of like, um, you know, off of clicks and traffic, right? So whether it's display ads, whether it's search advertising, you know, this the system which was very much around built around like documents with unidirectional links, right? The the people who created uh, the original web. They, I don't think it ever occurred to them that you wouldn't create a reciprocal link if, uh, if uh, you didn't, if uh, uh, the, they, that uh, you wouldn't create a reciprocal link and make links sort of bi-directional if there wasn't like a good reason, if there was a good reason for that link to exist. And so it's really interesting that we have all these one-way paths through the internet where you click a link or, uh, or you land on a web page from uh, Google, you don't actually see what other web pages are linking to that page? Google knows that because that's part of what their signals and ranking use to determine the um, determine the relevance of the page that you're on. But we're kind of in this trap where everyone's kind of going one way through the internet, and you also have this erosion of natural sort of links between web pages that make the web like much harder to navigate. So now everyone's taking these really short trips into the web, right? You click a, 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 a you click a you know a search engine, you type something. A lot of times people are just typing Facebook into their search engines because that's how they navigate. And uh, search has become this like critical point, jump, like dropping off point where you like jump into the internet. Like I, I, I use this metaphor where it's like a really bad um, mass transit system, right? Where you, the, where you exit, there are actually a relatively low number of exit nodes from like the, you know, the top search terms because of a lot of it, there's a lot of technology and effort on like sort of concentrating where the search results are and what like what gets the attention. And so everyone kind of ends up in the same places and you end up on an interesting page. It's much less likely now than it was 20 years ago that that page would link you to another page to help you learn more things. And then you're starting to see, you know, these echo chambers that are happening now where, you know, you have, you know, 
web pages across the political spectrum, right? You could have, you know, something that is uh, uh, far right or far left, and they're never going to link to something like a little more moderate, right? And so one one of the tools that we used to have where people used to like build an understanding of civics and politics was to read, you know, the same neighborhood newspaper, the same city newspaper, and get um, and get different editorial perspectives on the shared set of facts. And that doesn't exist anymore. Now you just have these silos of like so that are really ideologically arranged that make it really that are really hard to break out of. You actually have to type a search engine to um, you actually have to use a search engine to like go to another page. Like if you're on you know if you're on Breitbart, like Breitbart isn't really linking to Fox News very much, right? Even though if you're a heavy Breitbart reader, you might care about what Fox News has to say, right? And so. Um, having that, so everyone kind of has these horse blinders on because the web is so vast, everyone feels like they have a complete internet and they really don't. And so that's sort of the, the gist of uh, what, what we were trying to explore at Mozilla, which is the idea that what you're doing right now, no one knows that better than your browser and the browser can do it very privately and help you go somewhere next. Right now, everyone has this experience where they're, if they're using a computer and they're searching Google, they click the back button and they look at another search result, right? It's sort of like these very short trips. We we thought of this like kind of cute metaphor of what if you had a better forward button, right? What if you could just like advance into the internet and find things that weren't there before? Could you do algorithmic sort of web rings for lack of a better, uh, uh, for lack of a, a better phrase? Could you, um, could you help people build a more complete understanding of something they were truly interested in without relying on their expertise, which, you know, by definition, if you're an expert, you don't actually have necessarily the terminology or the jargon to, to really uh, navigate the web well. And so, um, so, you know, these are all like sorts of symptoms of the, uh, the core problem, which is um, that the web had really eroded a lot. It's a lot like, it's a lot like global warming, right? No one is setting out burning, they're not burning fuel just to like add CO2 to the atmosphere. Right, CO2 is added to the atmosphere because of human activity, but it's because people were driving cars or, you know, uh, materials are being shipped around the world. There's mining to build new objects. There's, you know, oil for fuel and for plastics. It's the same thing. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that, you know, Google or, or SEO are like this sort of secret plan to destroy the web, but it's something that's sort of a natural side effect of, you know, 20 plus years of SEO, right? That like people making, basically rational selfish decisions have like sort of created these silos and it turns out these silos had have kind of a negative effect on uh, what I think of as the utility of the internet. Yeah. So before we dive into what exactly a forward button could look like, because I think, yeah, it is a cute phrase, but it's also a very interesting idea. Um, let's touch more on what your points are there, which is that in the early days of the internet, you truly could surf the web in the sense that there was no, there, you weren't on any monetizable tracks, which is what we see today, where you're, everybody that experiences the web thinks that they're surfing the web nowadays, unless they're very tech savvy and they realize what's happening behind the scenes. But we're actually all on these kind of pre-planned tracks that these algorithms and these systems have already decided is the best way to monetize us and push us from here to there. Um, yep. So explain how that came to be. How is it that now we're on these tracks and 70% of our time and traffic is spent on the top three or four platforms? Well, I think part of it is, uh, there are a lot of reasons, right? One is convenience. It's just simply convenient to type something. And you know, anyone who's tried to build a search engine knows that like language processing is really hard. It's really expensive. If you're 10% better, you get the whole market, right? And so it's not surprising that Google has the talent and the investment to turn these like sort of poorly worded Raises into useful, actionable results. The other part is that um, I think there's mark there's more market power for established players to literally will competitors out of existence that has never really existed before, right? Look at um, you know if you look at the Alexa top 100, right? And you just look at like sort of U.S. best based sites. I'm not going to China's kind of in this like separate sort of you know gold rush, right? But if you look at like uh, you know uh, anything but China. The newest web page that broken the newest domain that broke into the top 100, I think, on the Alexa, uh, the Alexa top 100 is uh, is Pinterest, right? And so demand generation, lead generation, all this is super expensive. When you're in a world and you've got a startup and you've got you know a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand seed funding, and your each user costs you ten to fifty dollars, 
and that's the only way if your presence is only online, it's the only way for you to be discovered. Um, what, do, uh, what does that mean for your startup? Well, it means that it's a lot harder to raise funding too, right? And so uh, you saw this like sort of proliferation of delivery uh, delivery um, services. And part of my like sort of conspiracy theory there is that, well, of course you would do something like that because you can put a sign, like product, uh, startups that involve signs on cars driving around that are visible, that's like free advertising, that's better lead generation. And so you're, you know, you're seeing like actually the cost of acquiring new users to be so high that you can't, uh, you can't compete. I mean, I don't think anyone thinks that Travelocity or, or Orbitz as great as they are, the, the final say in, in travel sites. But when Travelocity has like a billion dollar SEO budget, right? Like you can literally have, if you have a billion dollars, you can just make sure that your competitor is invisible. If they don't know about you, don't search for you and the search terms are, and you're bidding on search terms like travel, you know, you don't like, there's no way that you have a travel startup to even get noticed. And then you go, let's say you've got a really great travel idea. You don't even get funded, right? One of my, one of my favorite uh, travel startups uh, that I used for my honeymoon in 2013 was a startup called Flight Fox. And it was a really cool idea. It was, uh, turns out Australia, one side effect of the Australian social safety net is there are a lot of Australian uh, retirees that are comfortable enough to travel, but also very frugal. And so they're experts at booking very cheap flights. And I ended up saving, I think like 80% on our honeymoon flights to Australia, but it works for anywhere in the world just because it was a, a kind of, it, the model was you, uh, you put in like, uh, you know, your travel request, you write it in, in normal English, like what you, here are the things you want to see and here, and here's what you're going to give to the winner in terms of dollars, right? You put a price on it's like, I'm going to give $50 for a great travel itinerary. I did that, a bunch of like Australian retirees like come up with their proposals, they had great suggestions on what to do. And yeah, boom, like here's some links to click on, kind of sketchy Polish, like travel booking site. I got in, but we got on our flight, we arrived, we saved 60%. That's a really cool idea. No one knows about it right? How would they, right? So, you know, I keep thinking about these, like, I don't think the evolution of the internet is done. And it's really, especially as a startup co-founder, like, it's really tragic to me to see like, sort of this, like, sort of ossification in consumer tech space, right? Whether it's, you know, even mobile, right? If you took someone from um, 2000 and brought them to 2010, the fact that everyone had this, like, super powerful computer that they carried around with them everywhere, and sort of the end of sort of idle boredom, in like modern society, that would have been mind blowing, right? You take someone from 2010 and you bring them to today, they, I think nothing would be surprising, right? iPads are faster, they're higher resolution, phones are bigger, but it's not like you couldn't hand, you know, a 2020 smartphone to a 2010 person and they wouldn't know what to do with it, right? You're starting to see, you know, the cycle of like refinement, which is valuable, but not a lot of disruption anymore. And uh, I think, you know, if, we're, if, uh, if a lot of this uh, innovation has to come from new small companies and, and they're coming in with this attitude that like I, my only path in consumer is to get noticed by one of the big, big companies that get acquired, then like that really shapes like kind of your pitch and shapes like the, the experiences you're trying to build. And you're trying to think like, not like what are consumers going to pay for, but what is Facebook's blind spot and how can I build well enough that Facebook will want to buy me up? Right, and that ends up with a different set of products, different set of thinking. And uh, I think I, I, I often lament the loss of what we had. Yeah, this is a great point to stick on for another minute or two, which is the idea of user acquisition. Um, you've started tech companies that have been acquired. I'm running a tech company, but I think for the average person, they don't appreciate that it's not enough to just build the best product. It's, it's not true that if you build it, they will come. You also yep. have to innovate equally on the distribution and how your product yep. reaches your target yep. user or customer. And you're right yep. that, that no matter how good some of these new products are and these new startups are, they're being starved out of attention. And sometimes we have really amazing companies and products die simply because they weren't able to find a channel into reaching new audiences. And yeah. I think that it'd be really interesting for you if you could speak a little bit to how when some of these tech companies that we do hear about, you know, whether it be a Pinterest or um, some of these bigger social platforms, when they do raise millions of dollars in startup financing, what percentage of that is actually just profit that's going to have to go back to Facebook and Google so that that as part of their user acquisition strategy to advertise to grow their user base? Yeah, well, you know, I've been out of the startup game for a while, but I think I'm very, I'm very comfortable in saying it's not zero. 
<laughs> right. Uh, and I'm sure you know, right? It, it's going to be a big chunk. I think I would say that it's probably even before they raise that, you know, Series A or that Angel round where they just get that, uh, you know, it's very, I think, American to sort of focus on like sort of future obstacles to success and say like, hey, but you're never going to be able to do this because this is what you're going to run into. And so why even try? Right. And so um, I think the uh, uh, I think, you know, I think there are a lot of um, a lot of I think it's affecting pitches. I think it's affecting like what you know, what people how people are ideating around these things. And uh, it's affecting like the exits, too. Right. And so, um, you know, I think everyone would love to create the next Facebook. I don't think anyone who's creating a startup today um, is really thinking that that's like a, a likely outcome, right? Compared to like, say even 10 or 15 years ago when like even the social space is quite quite crowded and competitive. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think it's like, I would even take a step farther back than that. I would say like, I think a lot of these like great ideas aren't even like getting seed money because they're, because you know investors are asking valid questions, right? What happens when you get noticed and you get outbid on all your keywords, right? Like, a, you know, te- we everyone knows about Tesla because they're driving around on the street. If General Motors had the power to make Teslas invisible, there would be no Tesla, right? I mean, <laughs> like that's essentially what's happening, especially on the consumer internet is that, yeah, like if, uh, if GM and Ford just say like, hey, like, yeah, you can sell your cars, but no one's going to see them. They're not, they're just going to be invisible. That's essentially what's going to happen. And we're going to make sure that like, you know, since no, you're you're in a new segment, no one knows, no one's searching for electric cars. But you know what? We'll we'll buy all the keywords on electric cars, so no one's going to discover it, right? Like I think, uh, you know, Elon. There are plenty of reasons to like and be wary of him. But one thing that I think he's been really good at is driving buzz and attention, which is essentially free advertising. If you follow the automotive industry and you look at the media planning and buying organizations, like these are multi-billion-dollar budgets, right? You know, these are like multiple billions of dollars go into media planning for all of the big three automakers in the US. So yeah, it's a, it's a, but even in, even with all that money, Ford and GM cannot erase Tesla from existence. Right. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Elon leverages his Twitter profile really well. And, and in doing so Tesla actually has uh, not had to spend any money on marketing compared to their competitors. It's a huge yep. advantage. I think another advantage that is playing out with Tesla is um, word of mouth. If you can yep. get to a point where people, whether that's on consumer internet or a car, love your product so much that they can't help but tell their friends about it, then you really have a winner because now your customers or your users are actually going out and actively um, creating those references and doing that marketing on your behalf. Yep. So that's the big win, right? You just well, it's, word yeah, of mouth. I, I, I agree. But you know, and, and cars are two tons and they're shiny and they're pretty. So there's lots of opportunity and you're in them out in the world. So there's lots of opportunities to have these like, you know, random conversations about your car. So that's why, you know, it's a, it's a physical product. People understand what a car can do. You can talk about it in terms of what this car does that the old car didn't do. Um, but you know, if I use Firefox, like I'm not wearing that on my sleeve, right? I'm not telling, people don't know I'm using Firefox. I'm using it on my computer at home or at a coffee shop. People aren't looking over my shoulder saying, hey, what's that browser you're using, right? And so it's like just so much harder with like pure like software, right? Or services. So you might be super passionate. Like uh, another thing is, you know, I've gotten, you see the Scooty printer in my background. Um, I've become like a really passionate user of, uh, I just, I didn't learn know any CAD until I use this tool called Shaper 3D, which is like, you know, built in, I think, Hungary or something. And uh, in terms of like a like a, a very powerful CAD program for beginners that has a parametric engine, like it's awesome. Like I design all these things, but like no one knows I'm using this tool, right? To design these kind of crazy objects that like people really like using. And it's been, you know, it's one of the things that like, you know, it's a niche market. Not everyone wants to hear about a CAD tool. Not everyone wants to hear about 3D printing. I'm super passionate about it, but I don't have the opportunity to talk about it because it's not relatable and it's not something that I'm wearing on my sleeve. Like maybe in the world, like if someone sees me like kind of like, you know, building something, they might think I'm a professional engineer or architect and I'm not, I'm a novice. And that's the interesting bit of that, that piece of software. So yeah, it's uh, it's tough, right? <laughs> but I want to see, I, you know, I, I grew up as an, like really believing in the power of technology to improve people's lives. And I want that, like sort of that, uh, the innovation that we lived through and experienced firsthand to continue, especially, you know, not least because I'm a parent now and I want my kids to 
to really be excited about like what uh, what opportunities the world has for them and what tools they have that we never had. Right. And one of the reasons that you came back to working at Firefox was because you saw these monetizable tracks and you mm -hmm. thought, OK, Firefox is owned by Mozilla, which is mm -hmm. a, a nonprofit corporation. And so maybe yeah. I can experiment on some of these different ways of letting users uh, move through the, the Internet and we don't have to make it built around. Are we doing our best to monetize them? We can actually get creative and just try to add the most value as possible. So let's dive into your experience there a little bit. What sure. was it that you were really hoping you could achieve when you, when you came on as vice president of Firefox product and how close did you get? Where did you get close? Where did you not get close? Yeah, I think what, you know, it's all, I'll be the first to say I made lots of mistakes. I think you have to, when, you, when you're in any executive job, I think you have to be okay with uncertainty okay with the mistakes being yours and okay with being disliked. And, and I definitely grew to be okay with all three of those things. Um, at Mozilla, I think the thing that I was really uh, most excited to see <laughs> at Mozilla, um, I was, uh, uh, where, where I really saw Mozilla's strength is that I think the origin story is a little bit, is a little bit different than what actually happened. So, you know, I think a lot of people think of Firefox as this like small, you know, scrappy upstart that rose from the ashes of Netscape and took on IE and, and crushed it, right? Um, the reality is a lot more interesting and complex, which is that, you know, Google uh, was up and coming, had great software engineers and had great ideas about what the web could be. And Microsoft was uh, still selling, you know, office licenses hand over fist, right? And so it'd be unreasonable to expect Microsoft to take a hard pivot into the web. But since they own the web platform effectively, you know, the, a lot of innovation was being stifled, right? And so I think the the barrier to ideas back then was really around like market strength and sort of technology stagnation. And uh, everyone's about the uh, uh, the antitrust action that Microsoft faced, and I think to this day, they part of their agreements they don't they don't have to admit to anything, but it definitely caused a shift in priorities for IE, which created an opening, a blindside opening for you know, uh, for uh, new browsers to show up. And Firefox, I think, had a lot of really, really great ideas at the time. And not only that, there was a lot of collaboration with Google in terms of like, hey, you know, implement these, uh, these JavaScript, you know, APIs and we're going to build something really great. And so from a consumer perspective, they weren't thinking about JavaScript APIs or JSON or Firebug or any of those things. They were just like, oh, I want that Google Maps thing. I want to be able to scroll my map without reloading it. And the only way to do that is Firefox, right? And so, you know, what uh, what really happened was I think you really created like competition between giants. And that's where Mozilla's strength was really great, right? Like you enable Google to compete with Microsoft and you get, you know, G Suite, right? And then now you have Office 365, you get really good outcomes for consumers when competition exists. And so for me, I looked at Mozilla as the lens as like this like really interesting neutral party that could drive competition and that our focus you know, should be on whatever was preventing competition from happening. And sometimes it's technology, uh, though in, you know, in 2015, it, it really wasn't, right? Like from a, from a uh, open standards perspective, Google was benefiting greatly from royalty-free technology, right? Because they were running YouTube. So having like having, you know, free technologies that allow people to stream content for free where the monetization model is based on views like that's great, right? Having open technology that was like easily searchable and indexable or is good for Google for obvious reasons. And so I think the, the other challenge was like, you know, why, can we take a look at like how people, what doesn't exist today and how can we enable that? Um, I think that was kind of the thing that was the most exciting for me. It's like, I, I, could, I saw like, you know, having our startup and having, you know, sort of a soft landing because I think our timing was right when mobile was getting big and we were more of a desktop thing, but there were lots of, you know, there are lots of uh, boring anecdotes I can share about uh, things we might've been able to do better with the benefit of, uh, of uh, foresight. But I think, uh, you know, going into, uh, you know, going to Mozilla, I really, you know, coming from like sort of retail where competition was very much alive and well between like brick and mortar and online and even, you know, between like, you know, large and small players. That was like really exciting because actually, you know, so believe it or not, being at Walmart, like you really felt like you were in a professional sports team. You were like, there was competition. You would win or lose based on your ability to execute. And that was like really refreshing. And that's how I realized how much I had lost 
you know, working in the industry for so long, you don't, it's like being the frog boiling in the pot. You don't notice how much has changed. And so I think coming back to Mozilla, I really wanted to, at least first and foremost, like, could we use the brow could we use the browser in a better way to provide a better experience, right? So that people who didn't install Firefox to get better tabs, but they got a better internet, you know, a more useful internet. And so context graph was really like kind of this idea of could could the browser be a more active participant in navigating the web? Um, your other question or like how successful, you know, search is still really powerful. I don't, I think, uh, I think Mozilla, especially given like a lot of the um, issues around disinformation, which we, which we definitely saw, uh, you know, even five or six, you know, five or six years ago, um, that like, I think Mozilla is like getting a, a lot more interested in like figuring out how to be a remedy for this problem that's really affecting the core utility of the internet. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things we learned is that uh, uh, a lot of these problems are hard. Uh, a lot of platforms that you might need to build your own stuff like a lot of these APIs are even shaped in a way to prevent you from doing really interesting things. So you, there's a lot of headwind. And so Mozilla seems like this really uh, wealthy company with a lot of resources, but compared to like say the Google Chrome team or the Microsoft Edge team, it's not. Um, because both Google and Microsoft have a lot of like, you know, they can monetize a lot more effectively, you know, and, and, and justify like sort of these big, uh, these big spends. And so the only way to really innovate is to do some, you know, really think hard about what Google wouldn't do. And uh, from Google's perspective, like they created like the most efficient business ever known by human beings, right? Like, I don't know if we'll ever see an, a, a business that is as uh, as efficient in terms of the inputs and the output and the profits you get out of it as desktop web search, right? So you even see like in Google's like um, SEC filings uh, in the documents they submit to the SEC, both Google and Facebook like routinely say the shift to mobile is a threat to the business and threat to profitability because mobile is people use mobile but doesn't monetize as well, and so you know you're, you're you're starting to see a lot of like interesting behaviors to try to like recreate that uh, that like success, and I think it sets the bar really high. I think that's why Google cancels so many things because like their you know their definite success is web search on desktop. Uh, with like that kind of efficiency in terms of like people and, and profit. And I don't know if it'll ever, it can happen again, right? Uh, you know, that seems like a once in a lifetime sort of business opportunity. Um, so anyway, context graph, I think we we did a good job of explaining our case. I think we ran into some barriers around uh, really understanding the role of partnerships and relationships. You know, being Mozilla, we, you know, we had really good relationships with standards bodies and not necessary like really deep relationships with you know the companies that might want to compete with Amazon Google Facebook right and sometimes you know you act you know the you what you want to do is have one giant that might be a, you know kind of a, a very strong monopoly in one area actually help them compete with another giant that's a strong monopoly in another area and driving that competition is really good right and so you know even thinking about payment standards and like how would you know what like how do you help you know, uh, like a, a credit card company be competitive against like an integrated platform like Google Pay or Apple Pay, because like you, we, we've seen this play out before, you don't want any one player to be super powerful, you want to enable competition. So I think like even areas like payments moving forward, uh, to say nothing of crypto, like is like a, an area where like anyone who's really interested in the evolution of the web needs to really think very hard about payments and think about how, like how do you build these like user aligned experiences that are popular and the only way to build really compelling user aligned experiences is to ally with big, you know, multi-billion dollar companies that may not share all of your values. And that's okay because you exist because your values are different than everyone else's. But the fact that your values are different should enable you to ha walk into a room and say you're willing to like be an ally and be straight up with people and not get laughed out of that room. So I think we made some progress, but I think, you know, we, we, it's, like anything, like you, you're building a boat, you're pressure testing it, there are leaks. And I think we just like found a bunch of leaks and kept plugging them. And I think Mozilla is still working on it. Right, and before you were leading Firefox product, you were working on the add-ons to Firefox, which mm -hmm. I guess you can think of as extensions or integrations or third-party yep. partnerships. How did yep. the team think about that? Because you just called out that Mozilla has these great relationships with these standards boards, um, yep. but not maybe not necessarily with 
uh, the perfect startups that could potentially integrate directly with the browser. What was the mm -hmm. internal management decision-making thought? Was it that you were looking for uh, a feature and then you would try to find a company and try to start talking to them? Or was it more like, what do we want to build? And okay, can we build it in-house and not need to talk to these other people who are already working on it? You know, it was actually a really wonderful time. Like uh, even things like, so people may not realize this, but um, you know, uh, the anti a lot of the like security stuff that started in Firefox, uh, even tabbed browsing started as extensions, right? And so I, I think there, that was like a perfect storm where uh, people really like they developed on Firefox first and foremost because the developer tools were just so darn good. And, uh, and we knew in Mozilla that we could, didn't have the team. It was a very small team back then uh, to build all the ideas that could happen. But we also knew that building all these ideas for like putting 200 features, 200 crappy features in a browser that were like, that had to be discoverable for each and every Firefox user didn't work, right? Wouldn't work. So I think what, what we saw our uh, opportunity uh, as, where we saw our opportunity was to create like visibility for these great ideas so that if someone had a specific problem, like could, could they find the solution to that problem, right? I think there were ideas that, uh, that um, the Firefox team even tried to like implement later on, which is around like if someone, you know, clicks downloads a lot, like maybe we should start recommending download helpers more, right? And so uh, stuff that's totally behave, not, not only behavioral because that's useful, but completely private, right? That is just triggered by like rules that are like downloaded to the browser itself. So I think the, the attitude was not like, hey, let's have a, a developer contest and have uh, extension people build stuff because Firefox was the new hotness uh, in the late 2000s, people just created stuff. It was more a field of dreams, right? The the best, the most engaged users, the high, most highly monetizable users that people shopped the most were on Firefox. And so you created this like sort of synergy where People were on Firefox because Google Maps worked better, you know, G Suite worked better. It was just like a, a better browser because the because of the synergy with like the 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 web players that were building great experiences. And then since the audience was there, audience pulls like audience pulls production, right? And so if the audience is there and they're you know the your the browser for better or for worse is pre-selected, like really engaged, really viable users, then add-on developers will come. Like there, there were independent add-on conventions that we would attend. And it was the closest I've ever felt to actually being a real celebrity, uh, you know, being like, you know, my early 30s and uh, being recognized as someone who works on add-ons and getting my picture taken with fans. Uh, it was just a di really different time. Like, it's really hard to imagine now. I think where, where we didn't really uh, think very hard was that developers need to eat. And uh, so, you know, app stores were coming on. It was this gold rush where you were seeing these like you know, before the app where the discovery model of the app stores really collapsed and became dependent on the same advertising as everything else, like creating a great experience on, on Apple, on iOS or on Android, if you like hit it big, you could all of a sudden make millions of dollars creating your, your app. And we had, uh, we had you know, add-ons like, um, like Adblock Plus that, you know, had millions of users, but no path to like selling them, right? And actually Adblock Plus eventually, you know, broke bad. And, uh, and actually, you know, started to like work in cahoots with the advertising companies, right? Because like they were, you know, whether or not you think it's reasonable, it's understandable why it happened, right? You have millions of users and they're super uh, loyal and they don't want ads on the internet, but uh, you created a problem that's worth billions of dollars or millions of dollars to solve and you can, you can extract that value another way. And so, you know, uh, if you don't charge users for products, then you kind of become, you know, you've heard this before, you become the product, right? If I, if I walked on the street corner with a, with a basket of apples and let's not, let's pretend COVID doesn't exist, you know, and I said, hey, free apples, you want a free apple? And I'm not clearly like, you know, working for an apple company, people will be very wary of that free thing. They would ask questions like, why are you giving away free apples? Do you have a business you're trying to start or whatever? It's like, if I said, no, I just think you should have this apple. I just like them so much and I want to share them with the world. People would be very skeptical, right? But we don't have that skepticism on mine. So we have all these free products and people really demand free products and I get it, free is great. But you know, every time I get an opportunity to pay for software, I pay for it. If it's $2, $3 or whatever, um, I don't know if I'm sending enough signal to the world. Uh, but one thing that gives me a lot of hope is that I think uh, this like subscription slash streaming model, I think it's something that people really wrap their heads around where you know, uh, subscription music, streaming music has really, um, I 
fixed a lot of the piracy issues around both digital video and digital audio. And I think it's like one of those things where uh, the, uh, the, those industries have accepted that uh, there are some people who will never pay for software. There's some people who will never pay for music, will never pay for video. And making the experience worse for the millions of people that are willing to pay is not a good trade-off. And so you've seen so much innovation in both like video on demand subscription and transactional video on demand where like you're starting to see studios like Disney get a bunch of other studios together. And I don't know about, you know, about this product, but there's something called movies anywhere. You log in to all your, you know, all your streaming services. And if you buy something on Apple, it shows up on Google play, it shows up on Voodoo, it shows up on prime. So you actually have this shared library. And so really cracking this nut of like creating convenience for money is really, I think is really the way to go. So yeah, I, uh, I think not everyone can afford to pay for things, but if you see things like internet.org, which was like Facebook's attempt to give people free internet, but basically free access to Facebook and Wikipedia, like that's not really good for the developing world to have like a very like sort of effectively censored version of the internet. So um, lots of interesting problems to think through there. Yeah, and before we move on to the work you're doing at vietfactcheck.org, mm -hmm. uh, last yeah. question, I wanna dive into maybe a real life example here. I'm not sure if you had already left or if you were there at the time that Mozilla acquired Pocket, but I'm mm -hmm. curious, maybe you can tell me and speculate a bit from afar. Do you think that it was the, that Mozilla liked the idea of a save feature and they just thought, okay, Pocket already has this audience using it. Let's just go mm -hmm. ahead and team up. Or do you think that they didn't even realize a save feature was important uh, for web browsing and because of the, the mass adoption of Pocket, then they came to realize it? That's a good question. I have so many random Mozilla facts in my head. I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, certainly, you know, working on delicious, part of the reason why I got the job as a director of add-ons at Mozilla in the first place is that I worked on the delicious Firefox extension. Right, which was basically cloud safe for your bookmarks, right? And, and you know, into a public store where people can see. So a lot of like uh, similarities to Pocket in the, uh, you know, in a slightly different format. So Mozilla definitely knew about this idea of like saving, you know, saving bookmark bookmarks being a useful thing to save and share and amp and and drive signal from. Uh, just because you know, Delicious had a trending front page and the the Firefox users who uh, were using the Delicious extension were very very loyal users. Um, uh, I think from uh, Pocket's perspective, I think it was, you know, this, I, this, this, this desire to be a little more involved on the content side because ultimately uh, a browser is a platform, right? It's like, a, it's like having like a really nice window to look out under like a nice landscape, but you don't actually own the landscape. You don't actually own, you know, even the chair that's looking through the landscape, looking at the landscape. You're just like this window that like, you know, is like is either really clear or really blurry based on like how well you, exe you know, execute your standards work. And not just that, like how well you like keep pace with de facto standards like Chrome because they're, you know, because they're a dominant player. Um, so yeah, I think part of it is really to try to like own more of the, the stack, right? Really around discovery and, and content and publisher relationships. Um, but yeah, beyond that, like the pocket team was fairly separate. I think a lot of it was also, we just liked the pocket guys a whole bunch, right? Uh, the pocket folks, I should say, uh, but the pocket folks have been, um, you know, I think they fit in really well in Mozilla. I think they were very culturally aligned. And they, since they started as a Firefox extension, actually uh, the uh, uh, Nate, who's no longer at pocket, but the founder of pocket, when I was a director of add-ons, one of my first things was to mail him a laptop because, um, because pocket had won the extend Firefox contest. And so he was a contest winner. So I remember mailing him a, a laptop. That was like one of the first things I did. So uh, for better or for worse, it's a very uh, insular world. Okay, cool. So it sounds a little bit like maybe it was a useful recommendation engine, a way to get the right content up inside the browser for the Firefox users as well. Yep. Okay, great. So let's move on now to vietfactcheck.org. I want to make sure we have enough time to go into detail there. So sure. tell us, what is the problem that is going on in this community that you're trying to address? Sure. So as we all know, uh, George Floyd was tragically killed in the summer. And uh, I think for many Vietnamese Americans, especially second generation Vietnamese Americans like myself, 
who are more politically engaged in the U.S. and, and follow uh, U.S. politics through like mainstream news sources, I think we were uh, we had a lot of very uncomfortable conversations with our relatives, right, around uh, systemic racism, even uh, basic civic knowledge, like the role of police in the criminal justice system. Um, and it was just really painful. I think a big reminder of how um, how far how these like these wedge issues have really driven us like farther apart from our families when deep down in our hearts, we know that our values are quite shared. And it becomes like a disinformation problem, right? That, um, that uh, Vietnamese Americans that are, that uh, primarily speak Vietnamese don't have a lot of great, uh, you know, Vietnamese language sources to understand US politics. Uh, even if you do translations of like Vox or New York Times, like you see the same sort of enthusiast trend in digital, in media that you see in digital cameras where, you know, people like Vox or Vox reporter doesn't have time to explain everything from first principles, right? A, a difficult policy topic. Uh, and that's not what the audience wants. The audience has been keeping up with the story and wants like the, the latest, right? And so uh, what you see is that what I found was, you know, I grew up in central Ohio. I didn't know very many other Vietnamese people. I don't speak Vietnamese very well. Certainly not well enough to explain politics to my family. And uh, I saw this problem where I felt like I had a pretty good, I had a really good understanding of tech, being a product manager. You know, I spent, I did my time really equating like clicks with happiness and understanding how like that was a really bad assumption to make. And so I understood the mechanisms of disinformation. And I also like felt very personally um, harmed uh, by, uh, by this disinformation that was running rampant in what I saw as my community. And as I like started to get more engaged uh, politically, particularly with other progressive Vietnamese American association, uh, Vietnamese American members of the community, I found that my experience was not unique, that there were a lot of people like me who read Vox, read New York Times, even you know, read some Fox, read some National Review, understood like I had a pretty good solid understanding of politics and policy and science, but didn't have like sort of the shared language skill to like communicate that with our families. Uh, Converse are the people who had uh, those language skills didn't necessarily have the fluency in in politics. And so uh, what I did was at first I just, you know, I do what a lot of people do, a lot of progressive people do is I joined an organization, gave them my money, donated it. I wrote a little bit of a bio. So, and then someone reached out and said like, hey, you know about misinformation, I'd love to talk to you. And I wrote a piece about like, here's, you know, here's how much media has evolved. Like I wrote basically a basic English media literacy piece on the evolution of the media how facts are no longer like shared anymore and uh, how money is sort of like, uh, has really uh, twisted the narrative. Um, and that was translating to Vietnamese. And then for the first time, I think, you know, my, my dad reads, uh, I think, you know, keeps up with the news fairly well. My mom doesn't really read the news at all. I think she just like, you know, her English skills are fine but she doesn't read things in English very much. And so it's really the first time my parents both read something that I wrote that was somewhat technical. And that was like, okay, that was, that was pretty interesting and exciting. And I thought about, and, and felt very meaningful. And then, you know, I started to think about this, you know, people who came uh, from Vietnam as refugees in the seventies and eighties, they really were escaping this thing that was labeled with communism. And uh, what it really was fascism and authoritarianism, but the rapper said communism. And so at the time the Republicans had like, I think a pretty, it was a really big part of the brand uh, you know, this anti-communist sort of brand. And so I always went through this assumption that like, you know, everyone, every Vietnamese American knows that Jerry Brown did some pretty horrible things in the seventies to keep Vietnamese people from coming to California. They came anyway, but you know, that, that sort of original sin became the sort of like, you know, this root of misinformation where, oh yeah, Joe Biden was in Congress and he was a Democrat. He also hated Vietnamese Americans. And I said, you know what, like we have way more records online. We have Freedom of Information Act. We, we can look, we can peel back and look at like contemporary transcripts like we never could before. Why don't I get to the root of this? And I went in uh, with a truly open mind. Like, you know, my assumption was that let's understand like what Biden said and what he did and try to contextualize his behaviors in, in the frame of, uh, you know, US in the 1970s that was very tired of war and, and struggling from multiple like economic crises. So I went and read it and it turned out, oh, you know, after Nixon, after Nixon, the Democrats had a huge majority in both houses and that the Vietnamese uh, refugees could never have come without like massive democratic support, even though the president was a Republican, which is like kind of very hard to imagine today. And I kind of, as I peeled back that onion and looked at like, uh, looked at these facts, I was like, hey, 
you know, what we've been lied to. It's not, I don't feel like my parents are not lying, not, you know, lying to me on purpose. They just don't know the truth because, you know, you, you, it, it's like, you know, a lot of information in a lot of communities is shared by word of mouth. And it's sort of the stories change a little bit and Jerry Brown becomes Joe Biden, or I don't know how it happens. Right. You know, they're not, it's just occurring to me that the initials are the same. And, um, and so there's this like really strong anti uh, democratic streak. Um, it, you know, and I mean that in both ways, anti democratic party and, and sort of awareness of this like thing called democracy in the United States. And so uh, we saw this opportunity to, really write things in basic English that were more self-contained. So we, you know, we started writing these pieces, starting with the Biden piece, but really explaining things like tax policy, under, explaining systemic racism, Jim Crow, um, explaining like sort of, uh, uh, sort of the, the comparing and contrasting like sort of the Obama administration to the Trump administration in terms of foreign policy and focus on Pacific, you know, Asia versus, you know, Western Europe uh, in the Middle East. And so, we spent a lot of time like really like obsessively writing like source verified content. We really used the internet to like make sure that any claim that we made was linked to a government source if possible, if not, you know, a mainstream news source, including ones that were like more right leaning because we, we wanted to create this content. And what we found was um, that there were a lot of people that were like, it's so great to be able to read something, understand it, know what I'm sharing with my family and share it asynchronously. Right. And, and they don't, you know, I know from, working with data scientists and user researchers that uh, you don't confront people. Conf confrontation is the worst way to change someone's mind, no matter what the topic is. The, what you really need to do is put them on a journey where they at least you know, feel like they're empowering themselves with knowledge. And so that was really the, the genesis of what we were trying to accomplish with the fact check, which was this idea that like, let's create these articles that are not like full of incendiary language that are not trying to be like you know, partisan hacks and to say like, look, here's misinformation. Here's why it exists. It it's fundamentally about money. People understand money. And then let's start, from, let's go from there. Here's what you understand about tax policy. Here's what you understand about the federal budget in the United States. And so, um, yeah, we've had some really great uh, progress. I think, you know, they're out of 2 million uh, Vietnamese Americans in the United States. Like I think you can, you can fairly estimate and say like a million of them are voters and we've reached, you know, 40 or 50,000 of them and it's growing. So I think it's a, uh, it's a really exciting time to be like really thinking about empowering my, our community. And I think one thing that we try really hard to do is like our core uh, belief is that misinformation is causing people to act against their own interests. Like we don't have to agree on, on, on social issues or economic issues, but I would much rather have a debate with you about the proper role of government in alleviating poverty than whether or not like the election was stolen. Cause that's a waste of everyone's time. Right. And so you know, I think our approach has been like, here are the facts, you can draw your own conclusion from the facts. And we try to like adopt this very, um, very neutral kind of like 80s, like newscaster news tone, which is like, here are some facts and you should be empowered with these facts so that you can make better decisions that, that affect you and your family, right? And so now we're spending a lot of time and I wish we didn't have to on COVID misinformation, right? And, uh, you know, and straight up lies about, you know, how vaccines work. And so, yeah, it's really, really great because it's not just me. You know, I, I picked the domain, but I would say like, it's, you know, other than that, like anyone can pick a domain. It, if without the help of like 50 volunteers that were just as passionate as me, it wouldn't have happened, right? We wouldn't have had people running content. I don't have the language skills to translate. We have incredible translators. We have an incredible managing editor who's a, you know, who's a real journalist uh, who's helped we've gotten. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think for us, you know, we, uh, what I've learned from my other experiences is to keep it very focused, to know what we are and what we're not, to help connect, uh, you know, different organizations that ask us for help in some way and be okay with saying no, because that's like a thing that, you know, it's better to say no to something that you're going to fail at than fail at something and become propaganda for why that class of thing is not possible. So, yeah, it's been, I think it's been really great and not having, um, you know, a uh, you know, my other job is full-time dad. So not having to worry about, um, you know, uh, about compromising, you know, my position as a corporate spokesperson, like I think really frees me to do this. Like, I don't know if I'm never going back to work for a company, but right now, like, you know, thinking about what my country needs, what, what like people like me need, um, like this feels like uh, the best I can do given what I know how to do. Yeah, no, that sounds great. So it sounds like it's a nonprofit. 
Yeah, it is a, it, so we are part of Pivot, which is the Progressive Vietnamese American Association. And it is, uh, Pivot is, uh, is a C4. So we're allowed to be more, more partisan. And so we do a lot of things like um, voter mobilization, voter education, and Viet Fact Check is really part of like the misinformation group, right? So, you know, this is a group I get set a donation to and then they like, you know, to their credit, like figured out that they could really make me feel like, you know, make, you know, take advantage of my experience, which I, which is what you want when you volunteer. You want to feel like your own experience can really benefit an organization that you're joining. So yeah, it's, you know, we're, and we're getting, you know, we're like, we, we just announced a collaboration with University of Washington um, doing some ethnographic research on our audience. And I think we're going to see more, you know, more grant money coming in. I think that's something we have to think about in terms of how do we maintain our focus and continue to, to advocate for facts, which is how we think of who we are. Um, and, you know, who knows where the future goes. I think there are other communities that share our problems. It's not our place to tell other groups, like, how to fix misinformation for them. But if there's anything of value that we can share, we're happy to share it. Right. And we started this conversation by talking about how it's not enough to just build an amazing product or service these days. You have yep. to have some way of reaching your audience, whether mm -hmm. that's distribution or user acquisition. What are you guys doing on that front? So I think the really interesting thing is we have a really motivated audience, which is people like me who are, you know, Gen Xers, millennials, you know, and Zoomers, like who have this like shared problem of misinformation really affecting relationships in your family and families are important to everyone um, and creating like the content that just doesn't exist elsewhere right um, Vox is not going to delve deeply into what Joe Biden did in 1975 with regards to Vietnamese refugees so um, having that audience and really building on a word of mouth right saying like uh, we see a lot of organic uh, traffic just like from clicks because people are sending our links via instant message or sms or whatever um, to their family members and it's getting read. We're getting really good engagement dwell time, right? You know, multiple minutes, which as you know, is a lot, right? And so uh, uh, the, um, so I think part of it is like having a very niche audience and like really understanding that use case, which is that, you know, America is such a complicated, wonderful place with a lot of immigrants. And particularly for new immigrants, you have everyone kind of fundamentally wants the same thing. Parents want good future for their children. Children want their parents to really understand, like really feel fully enfranchised as Americans who are voting on issues they understand, right? And so um, I think it's uh, really just so important. Uh, it's such an important way for those of us who've gotten so much from this country to give back and make it a better place. And so I think uh, we have a lot of, what turns out like to my great uh, admiration, I think there are a lot of people in that boat. Uh, of course we do a lot of, you know, kind of like social media, but like, as you know, you, you know, vietfactcheck.org is the web and I really hope you put this in the description I will. you cannot put a, you cannot put a link in Instagram right unless it's an ad and so we you know we have to like meme we have memeify we have younger people than me memifying our articles and so it's like kind of this like you know hot take stuff that is like it's you know it's hard hitting and like it works but there's so much context that's missing because we just can't create a link to the web so we're doing all the normal things you know uh Twitter is not used as much by the Vietnamese community, but we do uh, do some Twitter. But in terms of Facebook and and Instagram, we're trying to push a lot out, and it's like it's like what you'd expect: less overall engagement, broad but broad reach. Uh, but what we're seeing is that the traffic to the website is people discovering it as a destination. It's kind of charming that you can create a website and people are actually going to the URL, versus like having it having that that experience like disambiguated by a platform like Facebook. Right. Are there any plans for an iOS or Android app? Uh, it's already responsive. And so, you know, I'm a, I'm a web person. So I'd like to think that, uh, uh, you know, right now with our audience, it's really the newsletter is a bigger deal than a native app. Right. Uh, maybe we, it's actually a really good idea to have people like uh, have people like learn how to add those home screen icons. And I wonder if WordPress has a tool for doing web notifications uh, because that's actually a really interesting idea, thinking aloud, uh, and I will look into that. But yeah, the the um, the web platform is actually quite powerful, particularly if you're doing content. And so I think for us, it's like we have to think about like you know, should we use notifications? I think also the um, the uh, volume has gone down a bit since uh, since the Georgia uh, since the Georgia uh, uh, runoffs, 
And so well, we're spending a lot of more time on COVID misinformation. Where this is sort of content that is evergreen. Yeah. And okay. so, yeah, that's that's what we're thinking about. So again, like, you know, the future is is wide open. We just, we, we're going to try to be as smart as we can about our decisions. Great. And there'll be, for listeners, there'll be links to all of these different sites in the bio. Um, before I get to the last two questions that I ask every guest that comes on the podcast, why don't you give listeners a few different places they should go to follow your work? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, if you want to hear angry ranting, uh, OSU Nick is my Twitter. Um, and you can find, I think, my medium there where I try to post things a little bit more long form. But honestly, uh, 99% of my online sort of publishing is on factcheck.org. Um, it's all anonymous, but you should read all the content. I didn't, I didn't write, you know, most of the content is not written by me now at this point, and that's fine. Uh, it's all really interesting. What I found is that people who even aren't Vietnamese, like the, there is a gap here in terms of uh, providing uh, uh, content that is oriented towards neophytes and novices for understanding basic civics uh, in the United States. And, um, so like, I, I encourage everyone to just take a look at that. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty findable. So uh, I think if you start with my Twitter account, you can probably find, find me elsewhere. Great. And last two questions for you here. Question number one is Bitcoin. Are you a believer mm -hmm. or not so much? Uh, Bitcoin is going to be so, uh, it's going to change. And I think it could go in lots of different directions. I'm not, uh, I'm not a believer necessarily because I think that uh, Bitcoin... There are a couple of properties of Bitcoin that are uh, that ex that are really interesting. One is um, that you know it was the first like cryptocurrency that really got traction. So I think uh, you know a uh, proof of work versus proof of stake. There are smarter people than me that argue about the benefits of both approaches. But the fact that Bitcoin is designed to be a deflationary currency that the last there is a point where the last Bitcoin gets mined, and uh, I think I'll be more of a believer when you can buy something other than you know, uh, drugs, if you can buy milk from your, your grocery store, it'll be really interesting. But, you know, the reason why, um, the reason why I think like corporate taxes should be higher is that actually having a standing army is really good for US businesses, because it also gives, uh, you know, some teeth to like antitrust legislation, right, and all these sorts of things. And I think an unregulated currency I think it'll be really interesting to see how it evolves, right? Like I think Facebook tried to do it with Libra, whatever they branded it now. And it turned out that their, you know, their thing was like, you know, was like kind of like a pretty conventional PayPal like thing with, uh, with some blockchain there just so they could say it was a cryptocurrency. So I don't know. I mean, I think it's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on, on Bitcoin. I know enough to know that I'm not, I don't have the attention span or the expertise to feel comfortable, like, you know, putting a lot of my own money in it, but certainly people made lots of money on it. I think that the, the, the thing I would say is that a lot, it's so, it, it underscores two things. One is that money is uh, basically rooted in shared belief and it is as durable as shared belief. So if, uh, so, you know, and, and shared belief in the value of money requires like stable societies, requires like, you know, sort of trust in the system, which is why the blockchain exists. Um, then the other thing is that like what that uh, people really need to understand is that if a big piece of their wealth or their buying power is tied up in crypto, that uh, through its very nature, it's not like, you know, if, bank, if you lose your password to your Bank of America account, there are ways to get it back. You know, people should be very educated about like what that means. Like one is your, your mattress is now stuffed with a million dollars. So you know, maybe don't say that your mattress is stuffed with a million dollars. Two is that if you lose the password to your mattress, you're never going to get that million dollars back. So I think there are a lot of like, I think usability things that like people just need to really understand to be educated. And it's not really something that I've uh, been super interested in myself, but I'm certain that there will be people that love it and will tell me I'm wrong. Um, and I'll say like, yeah, I could be wrong. I'm not an expert. Okay, great. And last question for you here is, are we living in a simulation? <laughs> well, I think the chances are yes, right? Uh, I choose to believe that um, even if we are, because I know that I think, or I feel like I'm thinking, I feel like I have a consciousness, I don't think it matters. I choose to not care. Yeah. So basically, I think uh, you're basically saying what I say when the, the guest flips it and asks me, which is that probably, but it doesn't really matter because I would do all the same things I'm already doing. Yep, exactly. I mean, I think 
Uh, I think you, you know, you start with thinking about like uh, just the nature of like, you know, uh, the physical properties of the world are like code. They govern like sort of interactions of, you know, matter and energy. And so I don't know at what point if you're in the prime universe, if that's not, how is that not a simulation, right? Like, so I don't know, in some ways you kind of hope it's a simulation because I think a lot more things are fixable and maybe, you know, you can start doing things like flying around or have magic abilities or use the force or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's not something that like keeps me up at night because I think uh, um, at least I feel like I'm me and that I have decisions to make that impact me and the people I care about. And I feel like the emotions I feel and the love that I feel for the people in my life that uh, I care about is real and that's sufficient for me. That's perfect. Let's end with that. Nick Wynn, thank you for coming on today's episode of the Credit Podcast. Uh, all the links will be in the bio and I hope listeners go and follow your work and check out vietfactcheck.org. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you.